Hi everybody, it's Whitney from All the Shelves. Today I'm going to be continuing my series on American literature by talking about books that were published between 1925 and 1929. For any of the previous years, I started with 1900, there are multiple videos and I will link those down below for you to go and check out. As I said in my last video, 1925 was a huge year in American publishing and I talked about a few books that were published in 1925 in the last video and I'm going to be talking about a few more now. The first book I want to talk about that was published in 1925 is Willa Cather's The Professor's House. Now I have read this book four times now and you can see just how much I love this book by how much I have written in the margins. I have three different colors of pen going here. I've got some blue, some red, some black, and I am just astounded by this book and I continue to be astounded by it. On the surface it's a pretty straightforward story. It's the story of a professor who is working on a giant project, his kind of magnum opus. At the tail end of his career as a history professor he's writing this big history and at the same time his family is moving houses from this kind of like older house that they rented to a house that is brand new and that his family is now going to own. And he's having a really hard time with this transition from the new to the old. Tied up in his memories of the old house is his study where he has done all of his work as a professor and which he shares with a woman who comes and cleans the house and also uses his room as a sewing room. Um, at the same time he also has memories of a student that he met and would spend a lot of time with in his studies named Tom. So that is kind of the framework for the book and the middle section of the book is the story of Tom. He is this like self-taught brilliant kid who comes from the West to New England and meets this professor and is an amazing student of history and of science and Tom kind of falls in love with everybody in his family. The story is very much interested in nature and man's relationship to nature. I like to think about it in terms of the sublime because you know I love talking and thinking about the sublime, but there's more to it than that. It's about America's cultural past and how America has um, maybe appropriated or maybe just highly reveres its kind of naturalized past um, through the figure of the American Indian and especially through an idealized figuration of the American Indian. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. It's also about academic life and the difficulties and depression that can be associated with academic life and living a life of the mind rather than a life of the hands because the professor in this novel really does just sit in his office and try to think of ideas rather than kind of get in the dirt and live the material reality of his ideas and that's hard for him. Tom represents this kind of idealized man who has actually had a chance to live out his ideas through the material world rather than just the metaphysical world. So I've taught this book, I've thought about this book a lot. It's a really beautiful novel and it is not as esoteric or like philosophical as I make it out to sound. There's actually a very clear plot and there's very interesting things that happen between characters, between fathers and daughters, husbands and wives, professors and students. There's a lot of like interaction that I find um, very beautiful. The next book I want to talk about is one that you probably have encountered in the classroom at some point and it is The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. I love Ernest Hemingway. I feel like there are a lot of women of my age group who don't respond to his work at all, both on the level of prose and also on the level of themes, but I actually respond to him on the level of prose and of themes. I feel like people have been unfairly harsh to Hemingway because of what we know about his life. I mean we know that he's like went to Cuba and tried to fight Nazis in his own ship and he, a ship is a nice word, his own little tiny boat, and that he went to Africa and he killed all these beautiful animals and that he ha was obsessed with masculinity and um, how cool masculinity can be. And I guess um, that's true and that comes across in his books, but I also think that masculinity can be really cool. Not that I think that killing big game endangered animals is cool at all. Obviously, I hope you would know that about me at this point. I don't I don't love that he was like a big game hunter, but I think that he's working through problems of masculinity in his novels in way that ways that are way more subtle than people give him credit for. So The Sun Also Rises is one of those books. It's about a man named Jake Barnes who was a veteran of World War One and something happened to him. The text keeps it fairly vague, but I think that it's pretty clear that he has been emasculated in some way. There's something wrong with his peener. 
And he is in love with this woman named Brett Ashley, who is one of my favorite female characters because she is just endlessly complicated. She is an example of the 1920s new woman, tries to just kind of go with the flow, sleep with whatever men she wants. Um, she likes to dance in clubs and drink excessively. Everyone in the novel drinks excessively. Every page I feel like is about them drinking. But she also feels a kind of emptiness. And the reason that I don't think that that's like a misogyny or or some sort of like lament that the traditional woman is a thing of the past but I think that there's a emptiness to all of the characters here and they're all ascribing to this modern way of life as a way to try to fill that emptiness this kind of void that erupts because of modernity they're trying to fill with modernity which is a kind of irony that um, Hemingway is exploring in this novel so the only time that Jake is ever feeling good about himself is when he's in nature and even though the way that he interacts with nature is in fishing or bullfighting. I don't think that it's necessarily about man's power to overcome and master nature, but more about a meaningful way of interacting in a natural world that is also very violent. Um, I'm not an advocate of bullfighting either. I'm not an advocate of a lot of the things that Hemingway loved, but I don't think that th that's a reason to discount the author completely because he's talking about the fragility of masculinity and he's talking about the way that masculinity can be very admirable and that masculinity can help build cultures up, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it is only meant for men and that doesn't mean that it is determined or that it determines others. I mean, there's a lot of fragility and feminization and discussions of what the feminine can add to a culture as well. So, you know, I think Hemingway gets a bad rap, not only here on booktube, um, but also in the classroom these days and in the way that we satirize him. Um, the Sun Also Rises is an absolutely beautiful novel. The ending kills me every time. Um, I just, I, I sob. It's so sad and it's so good. So if you haven't read The Sun Also Rises yet, if you've had bad experiences with Hemingway, um, maybe give this one a try. The next book I want to talk about was published in 1929 and it is Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. Directors have tried to adapt The Maltese Falcon a few different times and the one that's most famous is the Howard Hawks version with Humphrey Bogart and it is really good. But there is something about reading Dashiell Hammett's prose that is just very satisfying. He was one of the first authors that was writing short stories in detective magazines and he sort of set the tone and invented some of the prose styles that came to be known as hard-boiled or noir detective fiction. This is a story of a detective who takes on a case um, thinking that it is one thing but that case immediately sprawls into something else. He gets caught up in a criminal underground that is all looking for this Maltese falcon, which is um, a enamel covered statue that once you break open that enamel is actually going to be a priceless artifact that is covered in jewels. And more importantly, it's kind of a status symbol. Whoever owns that Maltese falcon is going to be able to move up in society in the way that we like to think is a um, real possibility in American culture, right? That's the American dream. But the fact that it is covered in enamel, that you have to do all of these horrible criminal acts that you have to give up um, any sense of dignity or values that you have to achieve that Maltese Falcon I think is very telling um, and is a very interesting book to be published in 1929. This is the year of the American stock market crash and the world is very soon going to be plunged into the Great Depression and so to have this book that is about the persistent but fruitless effort to achieve a kind of wealth that is also kind of priceless is um, really interesting to me and a really good condemnation of kind of the excessive quality of the 1920s. The last book I want to talk about from the 1920s is Nella Larson's Passing. Now I have the Norton Critical Edition of this and it looks like it is ridiculously long, right? But the novel itself is only a couple hundred pages, so no need to fear. Um, Norton Critical Editions are always very helpful for study, but they are not the most aesthetically satisfying things to read. They have really tiny type and the pages are always really thin. Not my favorite editions. 
Anyway, Passing is the story of two light-skinned African-American women, one of whom decides to pass as a white woman, and one who decides to encompass herself in black culture in Harlem, New York in the 1920s. Obviously these women are going to have a lot of tension. Um, there's a lot at stake in Passing in the 1920s, especially when you consider that these are women that are also involved in romantic relationships. That's all I want to give away about this book. And I I do think that this is a book that has gone very underappreciated. Nella Larson was an integral part of the Harlem Renaissance. We should be studying her more, and specifically we should be studying this book more, a book that it was way ahead of its time thinking about identity politics, thinking about the way that you can choose and craft an identity, um, the way that certain people are not going to let you choose and craft that identity, um, and the way that race is imaginary, although it's also extremely real. So there's a lot of ideas here that I think predate Toni Morrison and that Toni Morrison did a lot of interesting things with, and if you like Beloved or you like Sula, um, you might really, really enjoy Passing. It's very straightforward, it's not like a modernist text like some of these that I've been talking about, and it's also very confusing and challenging um, just because it really forces you to think about race in some new kinds of ways. That's it for me in the 1920s. I've given you nine books that are some of my very favorite novels from that time period, and some of the texts that I think are representative of some of the main concerns and problems that American authors were dealing with in the 1920s. Let me know what your experience of this decade of American literature has been. I am very interested especially in the books that you studied in school because it does seem that the 1920s are very heavily represented, especially in high schools. I think everyone encountered Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Wharton, or Cather if they went to school in the United States. And so I would love to hear what your experiences were like with those texts in the classroom. Did you love them? Did you hate them? Did your teachers find ways to make you excited about the time period? Or was it a negative experience for you? Um, please comment down below, let me know, and we will continue this discussion into the 1930s. See you later.